Hello, Old Testament folks. Uh, we are continuing our study of uh, the short stories. Uh, Professor Yoder kicked us off with a study of uh, Jonah uh, and Ruth. And so we are moving now uh, into uh, the sort of st the other two short stories, really. Um, uh, some of these are a bit debated. Uh, Daniel isn't really a short story in the way that Esther is and the way that uh, Ruth and Jonah are. That is that they are uh, constructed with one entire narrative. Um, Daniel 1 through 6 is a bit different. Um, and and we'll, we'll get to that, but it's more episodic. Um, but these fit together, Esther and Daniel 1 through 6, um, because of uh, their genre. We can also maybe put Nehemiah into this category too. Um, remember, genre means a kind of literature, a type of literature. Just like I'd say um, a love song or uh, a short story, uh, or I might say uh, a joke, right? Those are all genres of literature or speech you know, a type of a cultural production uh, that you can understand in a category. Uh, so uh, Esther and Daniel, um, uh, Esther might be more of a short story. Daniel might be more um, very short uh, episodic stories, um, but both of them also share something and that is uh, their cultural setting. Uh, we believe that both of these uh, bodies of literature, Esther and Daniel 1 through 6, um, both correspond to a similar sociological position. Um, sociological meaning like a kind of, uh, if we study society, uh, we might talk about different roles that people might play in societies. And one of those um, uh, social positions that we can talk about is someone who is in, a, in diaspora. Uh, so we'll get to what diaspora is in just a minute, but these are diasporic court stories. Um, these are stories um, written by and about uh, people who have been displaced from their homes, who are living um, not in exile anymore. The diaspora is more long-term. We'll get into the details of that in a minute. Um, but these are people who are living for a long time uh, in another place, another culture, another country, uh, and they are working in the court of a foreign king. Uh, so like I said, Nehemiah is, at least starts in this um, world as well, somebody working in the court of a foreign king. A fairly common thing uh, from the upper echelons of a society that had been conquered and displaced uh, that uh, some of the elite would be taken to work and live in the court of a foreign king. We can see this at the end of Second Kings, say, uh, that uh, Jehoiakim, the king, uh, is taken into, uh, into exile, into Babylon, and is also seated kind of at the king's table. And, uh, and there uh, is watched over a bit. Um, and we can imagine um, that the prophecy came true uh, from Isaiah that we can see in both 2 Kings 20, but also in Isaiah chapter 39, where Isaiah tells Hezekiah that some of your descendants are going to serve foreign kings. Another thing that happens uh, if someone is taken to work in the court of a foreign king is that often they are um, made into eunuchs. Uh, what that means uh, is different in different times and places. Um, there's a wide cultural array of what that term means, but what it means physically is that um, especially males that are brought to work in the court of a foreign king would be um, castrated. They would be uh, rendered um, uh, physically impossible to produce uh, children. The purpose of that is to keep them from usurping uh, the king or to kind of meddle with what was understood to be the king's property, the harem, uh, so that it is the, the wives of the king. Uh, so we can see in Esther that this is a big part of the story. The the wives, the women uh, who are part of the harem, the kind of, um, in a way, uh, the understood to be the property of the king according to the gender hierarchies of the day. Um, but then also uh, with the women, there are sometimes these eunuchs, these these court officials that work with the women like Hathak um, who works uh, uh, with Esther. So in any event, uh, these uh, uh, this diasporic setting also can help us to think about Daniel and his friends and why they don't have wives. Um, and. Uh, why they don't have children. Um, they are they are eunuchs working in the court of a foreign king. Daniel, uh, as we'll see later, um, shifts in chapter seven to a, a very different setting, a very different circum set of circumstances and a different genre. Uh, chapter seven through 12 of Daniel are apocalyptic. And that's what we'll finish the semester with. So. The first thing we should talk about is diaspora. Uh, the diasporic is an adjective describing someone who is in diaspora. Um, so uh, we can see this map up here that I put up here. That this is uh, a an, an map of the ancient Near East, but then also into the Mediterranean basin and into um, some of Southern Europe and Northern Africa. So you can see Jerusalem at the center of that map there, and you see all those lines pointing away. Um, uh, this sh starts to show us the Jewish diaspora. That word is often associated with, with Jews and Judaism. It is um, a very interesting feature of the ancient world that most people who were displaced and spaced around, who um, 
who lost uh, political authority ended up uh, losing their cultural identity, their their former languages. Um, one of the groups that manages to maintain their ethnic distinction in the ancient world as they are spread around the earth is is the Jewish people. And they were famous for this uh, fact. In fact, uh, uh, one Roman geographer, Strabo, talks about how uh, where he he's like hates these people and these the Jews who like worship these strange this strange god and he called, you know he thinks they're atheists right because they they say that the other gods don't exist because they're monotheists right so they're atheists um, uh, you know everyone in the ancient world believes all the gods exist except this one weird people right uh, and so Strabus says wherever you go around the world you, you whatever port you pull into you you run into these these weird Jewish people, right? This describes the state of diaspora. Um, and, and also uh, it describes some of the social location of people in diaspora. Uh, and that is that often they are reviled. Um, they are uh, both um, important to these communities. Uh, Jews who uh, exist in diaspora exist in these um, small, uh, often uh, kind of uh, self-reliant communities, and often they are very productive. They do a lot. Um, they produce a lot. The, uh, it's it's kind of a, um, uh, in many ways, a, a, a cultural a denigration. It's a stereotype that's used evilly and in and in um, you know racist ways to talk about uh, the Jewish bankers and so on. But it's also true that throughout history, uh, Jews have done a very good job of uh, providing for themselves in very trying circumstances. Um, sometimes through financial um, uh, kind of lending, um, which uh, has often been outlawed in different places and different times. So, so in any event, the, uh, the Jewish people have been adept, uh, resourceful at uh, keeping their identity um, in the diaspora. Today, we can talk about there are many, many different communities that have managed to use things like technology and um, letter writing and lots of other um, kind of uh, modern world inventions that have made it um, somewhat easier, no less difficult, but um, but easier in terms of the, the practicalities of it to, to keep in touch and, and to be diasporic communities. So we can talk about like the uh, Puerto Rican diaspora. Uh, this is how some Puerto Ricans talk about their own uh, displacement from the island of Puerto Rico um, and uh, and living abroad. So, uh, and I, I've got a picture over here of uh, the, in the Middle Ages, this is a, a, a Christian um, uh, drawing. This is a, a Christian uh, um, illuminated manuscript drawing that shows a king, um, this is, uh, I believe, um, uh, this is uh, King Louis uh, in France, the exile, the, the displacement. This happened a lot throughout European history where Jews were, were kind of kicked out of the country. Um, so Louis the Pious, I think, um, Louis the Twelfth, I believe, um, exiled all Jews from Paris and then from all of his territories that he owned in France. Um, this also happened in Spain in 1492 with the Reconquista. Jews were um, forced out of Spain, all Jews. Um, this happened in England a couple of times as well. Um, so Jews were both mistrusted but also were able to hold on to their identity. So uh, what makes diaspora different than um, other categories of movement and social location? Uh, so we've already talked about exile. Exile is very different from diaspora because in an exile, uh, you are moved away from your home uh, and planted in, in a new place, but you are actually yearning and longing to go back home. And that eventually is kind of the goal is to go back home. So if you're in a state of exile, you live your life oriented back towards your homeland. And that is going to relate to and kind of uh, in, in, infiltrate like all of your different relationships and your different ways of thinking about the place where you live and the place where you want to live. Uh, so we, we can treat exile as one kind of category of social location uh, of people who have been displaced. Another one might be immigration. Um, you can see how exile and immigration are very different. Someone who immigrates to a new country, they, there are a lot of difficulties involved. They, they, um, they may not be treated well. And so there's a lot of similarities there. But at the same time, someone who immigrates is saying to themselves, I am going to make a new home here and I'm, I'm not going back. I may go back to visit, uh, but I'm going to be living in this new place. Um, and there's an attempt there to try to make a new home that is going to be permanent uh, for for that, that person, but also for that person's uh, potential progeny. So there's a way of like making a new home. Now, you, when people immigrate, they don't give up their old identities, but there's a different way that they might think about maintaining them or retaining them or thinking about um, in some way integrating them with their new culture that, in which they live. Um, so someone in exile might be really reticent to take on new cultural practices. Someone who immigrates might be more open to taking on new cultural practices. Of course, that's all kind of negotiated with individual people in individual ways but it's still a diff an important difference. Um, a third category we might say of people who are displaced would be diaspora. Um, and that's different from immigration because someone who is in diaspora thinks of themselves not as I'm trying to become 
ma maintain the old self but become a fully integrated new part of the uh, of this community to which one is moving um, but diaspora is more uh, there's there's some resistance uh, baked into that too so someone in diaspora is not uh, purely longing to go home like someone in exile their life isn't oriented towards the eventuality of their return to their homeland uh, but it's also not a full immigration to the sense that they they want this to be their fully uh, fully integrated new homeland um, there, there's, there's a kind of, there is some acculturation that happens. Um, that is, people have to kind of uh, become a part of the new culture in some ways. But in diaspora, they also are trying to keep their new community, uh, or like the, they're trying to keep a bit of the old community in this new place, which is a different way of thinking than trying to just just keep the old alive, if that makes sense. So people in exile might try to just maintain all the old ways. People in diaspora might say, hey, listen, uh, I, for example, to take Puerto Ricans, right? Puerto Rican living in New York City. I'm not gonna try to do everything the same way that people do it in Puerto Rico because now I live in New York City and I'm gonna live here for good, great. And my kids are gonna live here, et cetera. But how do I stay a Puerto Rican um, oriented towards my homeland, but not oriented in such a way that I can't wait to return? Um, it's kind of accepting the long-term nature of living um, as a minority within a larger culture. Uh, so this diasporic identity can cover a lot of people um, who have been displaced over long periods of time. We can also today talk about the uh, Africana diaspora, um, uh, which uh, is complex and complicated in part because um, of different uh, social waves of movement, uh, but also because of the history of uh, European enslavement of African-American uh, peoples and African uh, uh, peoples in Europe and uh, more abroad you know, throughout the world. Um, of course, the uh, the the uh, Middle Passage trade um, to both North and South America um, uh, has resulted in many millions of uh, displaced peoples um, who uh, have a very complex relationship to um, to each other, to to the cultures from which they've been displaced, and and those cultures uh, who remained, uh, they have a very um, uh, complex relationship to um, the resulting African American uh, community. So we can say. Um, the uh, community of displaced um, uh, Africans who ended up in Haiti um, is a very different culture, uh, we might say, than uh, displaced African peoples who now are residents of New York City, right? Um, who are very different than um, uh, African American people who uh, have come and integrated into the community and, and in some way um, uh, made a choice, right, to relocate. Um, so people who immigrate from Nigeria today uh, to New York City might have a very different experience than uh, someone who uh, was brought over, whose family uh, was brought as, as an enslaved people um, several hundred years ago and then had been living in the American South and then have migrated to the American North after. So you can see that there's very complex layers of what diaspora can mean to different people. And there can be different kind of sub-communities within what one might think of as a larger community. Um, so Judaism is like this too. And ancient Judaism was even like this. Uh, I bring up all these really complicated um, uh, examples primarily to say when we look at this diasporic literature, we're not looking at just all the same people. So Daniel and Esther are different. They represent different ways of engaging with a foreign power as a d displaced person. So Esther and Daniel, uh, we might we might imagine like all the rules of the game, like how to be a, a diasporic Jew, were all kind of settled um, pretty early on, and they're all following the same plan. Um, but they're not. Uh, just to take one example, notice like food, right? In the story of Esther, how does uh, how how do uh, Jews relate to Gentile food or you know foreign the nation's uh, food? I mean Esther eats and it's fine. And there's there's like nothing made of it, right? Um, but think about Daniel and the relationship to foreign food or food from the plate of a king, right? There's a big deal made of that. Uh, so we can say that certain um, uh, different subgroups within diaspora, in different points in Jewish history, have had different relationships um, to. Uh, to the cultures in which they inhabit, right? So in which they exist. So all to say that this is, you know, discerning um, these slight differences is actually really important for understanding this literature, at least I think. But the broader category of diaspora, I think is really helpful for us to, to think about um, these authors and uh, the people to whom they were writing and whom they were writing about. So again, this word here, diaspora, and we would talk about the social location of diaspora. Um, and I just wanna show you this map to say, these are all places within, uh, you know, uh, a century or two uh, after Jesus and before Jesus. So this is, uh, you know, uh, right around the time when the Bible is kind of forming and um, uh, and, and the idea of a canon starts to emerge. Um, these are all the places where we have uh, archaeological and literary evidence of Jews living. Um, so, like, at the time of Jesus, 
Jerusalem's actually a pretty small place. Uh, there are way more Jews that live outside of the land of, of Israel than who live in it at the time of Jesus. Alexandria, the city, has maybe a quarter of a million Jews in it. Jerusalem's got, I don't know, 30,000 or something. So uh, Jews, like I mean, total. So the the we, we talk about like a, a community that is very uh, is out has outsized um, uh, uh, influence from uh, the diasporic world, uh, and of course Jews living in Alexandria start to speak and write in Greek, which is why we've got Greek versions of the Bible um, two hundred years before Jesus lived. I mean, it's pretty intense um, and uh, fascinating. Uh, but anyway, uh, there's there's a lot more to say about um, uh, the social location um, of, of Jews in diaspora, but I'll have to end this here. But just to say this is a really interesting and important um, area of research. And if you read more and try to preach or teach about Esther uh, in Daniel 1 through 6, I hope you engage with some of these ideas more. So we would talk then about uh, genre or types of literature and form criticism, which remember is the kind of scholarly way that we try to um, understand both the genre, the type of literature, but also the setting, the social setting from which it comes, that setting in life, like where would you use stuff like this? Um, both Esther and Daniel 1 through 6, I think, um, are trying to form communities. Uh, this is again court uh, in, in literature in the court of a foreign, stories in the court of a foreign king. Um, who would read this stuff, right? I mean, it's kind of an interesting question to us. You know, uh, who who would write this? Who would read this? Um, I mean, they're good stories. They're fun stories. But why write stories like this? I mean, and for us, uh, biblical scholars, we look and we say, well, these are probably not written by people in Jerusalem. These are probably written by people living in diaspora. And they're trying to think through these big questions. Uh, and if you try to just imagine for a second, what would those big questions of diaspora be? Let's say you're a Jew. Uh, living in uh, the year 400 BC and uh, the exile has come and gone and you're still in Persia, like Esther. Esther's in Persia. Uh, people are living back in Jerusalem, at least some of them, but Esther's still out there. Um, what would be the things that you think about or worry about? What would keep you up at night? Um, this, this literature, I think, is written to help people deal with some of the personal, social, theological, cultural uh, difficulties that come um, with uh, with the social location of diaspora. And think about it too, that uh, Esther ends up in, in some position of power. Um, it's a really important issue that a lot of these people who were displaced and ended up living in foreign cultures, a lot of them were typical workers. Um, we have uh, evidence, as uh, Professor Yoder has pointed out from the Marashu archive, that there's lots of Jews living uh, in Mesopotamia well into the uh, Hellenistic period. And they're just doing, they're doing their work, they're doing jobs, they're, they're typical uh, laborers or they're uh, people who own small businesses and things like this. Um, but also there are some who make it up into the high echelons of power. There are some scribes that end up working for foreign kings. There's some uh, people who end up marrying into the royal family or becoming part of the administration. Um, so Nehemiah is the cupbearer to the king. Uh, you got some pretty big questions to ask if you are Nehemiah or if you're Esther and you're in these positions of power. Um, and you have some pretty big issues to think about in terms of your identity. So we'll get to that in just a moment. But in any event, these stories, the point of the genre, right, uh, the use of it uh, is to try to help people um, maintain their own sense of identity, like who am I in the midst of this culture, but also how to do that and not stick out so much that you end up uh, dying getting, you know, or getting abused and uh, becoming the object of scorn. Uh, how do you um, get ahead in your workplace um, as a minority uh, individual? within a majority culture that is um, toxic to you and is uh, trying to take some things that um, you uh, cherish about yourself, uh, some of the things that make you who you are, um, some of the things that give you hope. Um, how do you remain who you are, but also how do you not attract too much attention from coworkers or uh, people around you who might um, be jealous of you? All right, so this is something we see in Daniel 1 through 6, and we also see it in Esther. There are people who are jealous of Jews who make it in in the court of a foreign king. Um, this is something that is not um, uh, out of the ordinary today, too. Uh, that is, uh, people who are minorities um, who make it in a certain context, they... We, if you kind of hear stories about people who, uh, from kind of personal experience, um, who have lived these um, these stories, yeah, people come out and try to take you down uh, because you don't belong here or you're taking my spot, etc. Uh, Esther and Daniel are written literally to try to help people deal with situations like this and also to help them understand, like, where's God in all this? Um, why is God letting us live like this? What's the point of this? So some of that theology is um, uh, implicit in these, and some of it is explicit, um, as we'll see. 
So uh, here's, uh, by the way, um, this is a, a picture of a Persian king. Um, this is uh, uh, Xerxes, uh, who is uh, receiving kind of a, a message, basically. This is when, the, when the, um, you see a sculpture of an ancient person putting their, their hand to their mouth. It means like, can I, can I say something? Can I talk to you? And it usually is someone in an inferior position speaking to someone in a superior position. So here's um, kind of a court courtier saying, hey, can I talk to you, uh, O king? Um, this is just to show you that uh, you know, these, these cultural interactions in the court were highly regulated and you needed to know a lot before you got yourself in hot water uh, or trouble with the king or some other courtiers and so on. I mean, it was um, a dangerous game. I mean, think a little bit like, uh, you know, Game of Thrones kind of stuff. Um, people were out for each other. Uh, and this was just a common part of the ancient world. So if you wanted to not die in a court, um, you had to know some stuff. So this is literature written uh, for people who have this kind of extra level of difficulty, right? Uh, that they um, have to navigate not just the court itself, but they have to navigate their own um, identity within the court. So this is what we call a court tale. Uh, usually these involve um, conflict or tension between uh, courtiers, uh, each other, or between the king and uh, one of the courtiers who is a foreigner. Um, so I'll just say that this is uh, you know, fascinating literature, helpful in so many different ways today um, as people navigate uh, complex um, situations of identity um, within our increasingly global world. So just a real quick thing to say about just identity itself. Um, uh, how do you make and how do you preserve identity? Um, we don't come with fully formed identities. Um, a lot of times we have to kind of do things. This is what um, uh, some of some theorists would, would call performativity. We perform our identities. We create them um, not just uh, kind of naturally, um, although there are some things that we inherit from parents and our culture around us and so on, but also there are things we do. Um, to perform, to, to create in a way and maintain and distinguish ourselves from others. Um, so this little, uh, oh, sorry, over here, um, this little image over here, I find really helpful. Um, and that's to say, <clears throat> if we want to have an identity, there have to be distinctions. Uh, if you want to have an inside, you have to have a wall that separates inside from outside. Um, if you uh, want to be someone, you also have to say something that you're not. You have to draw lines. Like, I'm not going to do that. That's not me. Uh, that's a really important part of the creation of an identity is creating a distinctions. And where you create those distinctions is not always like clear, especially if you've been displaced into a foreign culture. Um, you know, what makes me me? And you, know, you can see this, all these stories throughout history um, from communities that have been minoritized and displaced uh, and then are dealing with a dominant culture. There's a lot of um, uh, a lot of the effort of that community, if they want to preserve their identity, which Jews, by the way, have been uh, one of the most um, uh, successful um, uh, preservers of identity in the face of crisis throughout the millennia, right? There have been many people throughout history who have tried to take away Jews' identity and destroy the Jewish people, and they have somehow managed to maintain. I mean, if you think about it, like Moabites don't exist, right? Phoenicians don't exist anymore. Um, uh, you know, there's you kind of pick any ancient peoples, um, and they don't exist like that anymore. Um, and yet, uh, you know, there's there's no Ammonites, but there's Jews, and there's Jews because they have been very successful at um, drawing distinctions that create a difference between themselves and other people in, around whom they live, but also drawing them in careful ways that don't uh, often, I mean, this, this doesn't always work, um, but oftentimes uh, create just enough kind of tension where uh, Jews can remain uh, uh, different and maintain an identity that is different from the culture around them, but also to maintain um, uh, some kind of uh, usually um, not quite hostile relationships with their neighbors. So how do you not be a target, but, but keep your identity? Um, and Esther and Daniel are the books that uh, have helped Jews negotiate these issues for millennia. And they've been, uh, like I said, with, uh, 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 it, it's not always up to, up to you, right? You know, it's not always up to Jewish people if they're gonna be targets or not. Um, but re remarkably throughout history, they have maintained, um, maintained their community and their sense of identity uh, in the face of turmoil. So this is just that idea that like a, 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 there's a marked state and an unmarked state. What it means like inside, outside, right? And the distinction is the wall. Uh, so how do you draw a wall between your, your community and the communities outside you in such a way that um, you, can, you can stay alive, um, but also maintain your identity? So. Uh, and a, a very famous uh, example of this in um, American, American history is uh, W.B. Du Bois, um, who talked about the, uh, the 
theory of double consciousness. Um, this was his, his uh, um, uh, idea that he developed uh, in the midst of writing um, uh, a very important, I mean, one of the most important books maybe one of the first true sociological books um, ever written called The Souls of Black Folk. Um, in his first essay in On the Souls of Black Folk, uh, which is called Of Our Spiritual Strivings, written in 1903, um, Du Bois uh, says that uh, it, he, he, the whole essay is a meditation on what he calls double consciousness, and that is the um, effort that has to go into everyday life for African Americans um, and where you always have to see yourself through someone else's eyes at the same time that you were looking through your own eyes. So what this means is uh, uh, if a, a white person um, uh, interacts with an African-American person and Du Bois in his own day was, um, you know, this is before civil rights legislation and so on. Um, and of course, a lot hasn't changed, but some things have. But so for Du Bois, I mean, there was always this um, very clear position of inferiority for African-Americans um, in that time and place. And so for Du Bois, you know, he, he's saying whenever I interact with uh, say a white man, um, I need to not just be thinking about the normal thoughts I would have in this interaction, but I need to be thinking, how does he see me? Um, what is he thinking about all the things that I'm doing and saying and how I'm moving and so on? And we can hear today in the witnesses of many um, African-Americans who have uh, uh, raised their voices in the wake of uh, police brutality over the past um, decade, really, uh, and more. Um, but this the sense that, uh, you know, there's this extra burden uh, upon African-Americans and a lot many other people as well. But, but uh, in the instance of police brutality, especially African-Americans, in the sense that like, there's always this kind of double or extra layer of negotiation that needs to happen and an extra effort that needs to happen um, in order to render oneself interpretable uh, to, to their neighbors. Um, in such a way that like, you know, do I, do I seem like I'm being too aggressive or do I seem like I'm, uh, you know, kind of out of place too much or, you know, and these kind of thoughts can be very taxing is what Du Bois is saying, but also require kind of training. Um, and so in any event, uh, for Esther and Daniel, I think that they're dealing with this double consciousness all the time. Esther even hides, right, as a way of kind of, uh, um, giving herself an advantage, she can, uh, this is an important part of the book of Esther, she can kind of pass as a way of putting it in modern parlance. Um, that is to say, she can uh, kind of slip by unnoticed as a Jew, at least for a time in the story. Um, so this is another um, uh, issue of kind of double consciousness. She knows the secret that she's not telling other people that that is always on her mind, I'm sure, um, which is this kind of extra extra burden, extra job that she has. Um, so in any event, all to say that, that uh, this, this what Du Bois is talking about, I think is, um, has been an issue among the Jewish community for, for some time as well. Um, but what Du Bois gives us some really excellent theory uh, that helps theorize it and helps us to, to see it. So I would recommend to you to read um, of the spiritual strivings, um, uh, of our spiritual strivings. It's a, a beautifully written essay and, and very moving. Um, so in any event, let's move uh, into Esther. I'm going to um, uh, kind of prompt us here. Um, and what I'm going to do is ask you to definitely read through uh, the book of Esther. Um, uh, and if you have any questions or comments uh, about Esther, you can kind of throw those in the forum. But what I want you to do is pick one of two things. Pick either overturning overturning, a motif of something being overturned, right? Try to find one instance of a, of a time in the book of, of uh, Esther where something gets overturned. And then a uh, second group, I'd like to say, uh, uh, if you could, um, uh, you know, you can choose which group you want to be in. So either pick overturning or pick uh, hiding and revealing. Find something in the text of the book of Esther where there is uh, something happens where something is hidden and it's revealed. So either overturning, either of expectations or literal overturning, et cetera, or, uh, or hiding and revealing. And uh, try, to, try to give some, you know, a bit of thought to that. I'll see you in the comments, uh, and then we'll, I'll discuss some of those things uh, in the next video when we get more into Esther. See you in a minute.